I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
lot of them. On behalf of 2012, I would like to thank the past officers who did an outstanding job and all the men who sat on the sidelines and participated in the lodge with our degree work and all the other functions that we have uh, were able to accomplish this year. Everybody did a fine job, more than a fine job. I would also like to take this time to thank all the wives, especially my wife, for uh, allowing all these men to be away from you at least one night a week, if not more, as we all know. Uh, the, the wives make a great difference in the lives by allowing us to do what we do. And we all, you, all owe you a debt of appreciation. Uh, I look forward to working in 2013 with the new master, uh, with your brother Andrew Moreyka. Uh, I'm sure you'll do a fine job. We've got a fine line of officers coming in and a plethora of new members that are itching to continue their Masonic journey. And they're showing a lot of enthusiasm, which you're voting well in Arizona number two. And once again, I thank you all for coming out. Officers, officers, proceed.
and mostly to make sure that there will be some apron stitching going on since they had their 2012 officer aprons on in the year, and some of them will be moving to a different position, I think, with an apron exchange. So that will take just a few moments. Uh, if you're interested in taking pictures, there really isn't any place in this room that you can't go to do that. So get to wherever you want to. Feel free to move around. I think the only thing we prefer perhaps to not have you do is cross right in front between here and that row of chairs. But you can certainly go from side to side in the room. And if your lens requires you to get closer, please get closer. Some of us look better with the dog filter. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Andrew for uh, inviting me to do this installation today. It's been a while since I've had something to do in this room, other than a funeral, which uh, we seem to have our fair share of. But it's nice to be here on a happier occasion. It's funny to see so many of you here. Uh, for those of you that are new to the organization or not members at all, or not as dependent of members, this is an opportunity for you to learn a little bit about what goes on in the lodge, uh, because each of the officers will receive a charge relative to their station. It will be a little recitation of their duties. I want to assure you, first of all, because some of you are going to wonder by the time we get to the end of this, uh, why did he have so much to say? Well, first of all, I'm one of those people to whom the sound of his own voice is music to his ears. But I want to assure you that I did not write the ceremony. It's the ceremony that was adopted by the Grand Lodge, and it does require a fair amount of speaking on the part of the installing officer. So with that caution, um, we will proceed as soon as the officers are ready. There's an interesting historical document down here on the floor leaning up against this card table. It's the uh, Charter of Arizona Lodge No. 2. It's dated 1889. Uh, you may know that this lodge was in fact started a few years earlier than that. The Grand Lodge was founded in 1882, so there's seven years. But Arizona No. 2, I think, was started in 1870. Or 78, somewhere back there, under the Grand Lodge of California. And it originally had a charter from the Grand Lodge of California, which I'm sure was at some point endorsed on the back and made over to the Grand Lodge of Arizona and Arizona Number 2. And I don't believe it was until 1889 that the Grand Lodge of Arizona, which was pretty small, got around to actually having charters printed and then issued to lodges. So if you go around and visit any of the five original lodges in the state, one through five, I think the dates that you're going to see under the Arizona Charters are all going to be 1889, even though some of those lodges were in business for a decade or more prior to that. But uh, that was looking promising for a second because the Deputy Grand Master came in and it looked like he was about to say something, but uh, then he disappeared again they have a way to do it. Uh, interestingly enough, too, on that charter are the names of some relatively famous historical Arizona families. Uh, the Grand Master at the time that certificate was issued was one Morris Goldwater. Yes, that family. Uncle of the Senator. Uh, Grand Master of the Grand Lodge, Grand Lecturer of the Grand Lodge for a number of years in the 1890s. The other name on there uh, at the bottom, the Grand Secretary's name, is probably better known in two sides, the name George Roscrooge, uh, who was a land surveyor uh, and was Grand Secretary of the Grand Lodge of Arizona for over 40 years, ending in the 20s. So uh, <coughs> he took a couple of years out to be Deputy Grand Master of the Grand Master, but other than that, he had a long time to be Grand Secretary. Now I see we have a quite worshipful deputy grand master in the room, so uh, most worshipful is Colin Master. The officers of Arizona Lodge number two lately elected and appointed or was out the door to wait your pleasure. 
Then installing our show, you will conduct them to the seats prepared for them.
Before commencing your investiture, however, it is necessary that you should signify your assent to those ancient charges and regulations which point out the duties of the master of the lodge, and which, on no account, are ever to be neglected or departed from. They are fifteen in number, and they are as follows. First, you agree to be a good man and true and strictly to obey the moral law. Second, you agree to be a peaceable citizen and cheerfully to conform to the laws of the country in which you reside. Third, you promise not to be concerned in plots and conspiracies against government, but patiently to submit to the decisions of the Supreme Legislature. Fourth, you agree to pay a proper respect to the civil magistrate, to work diligently, live creditably, and act honorably by all men. Fifth, you agree to hold in veneration the original rulers and patrons of the order of masonry and their regular successors, supreme and subordinate, according to their station and to submit to the awards and resolutions of your brethren to pray to me, in every case consistent with the Constitution of the Order. Six, you agree to avoid private peace and quarrels, and to guard against intemperance or excess. Seven, you agree to be cautious in carriage and behavior, courteous to your brethren, Faithful to your lodge. Eight, you promise to respect genuine brethren and to discountable impostors and all dissenters from the original plan of music. Nine, you agree to promote the general good of society, to cultivate the social virtues, and to propagate the knowledge of the other. Ten, you promise to pay homage to the Grand Master for the time being, and to his officers when duly installed, and strictly to conform to every edict of the Grand Lodge or General Assembly of Masons that is not subversive of the principles and groundwork of Masonry. 11. You admit that it is not in the power of any man or body of men to make innovations in the body of Masonry except as duly authorized by the Grand Lodge. Twelve, you promise a regular attendance on the committees and communications of the Grand Lodge on receiving proper notice, and to pay attention to all the duties of Masonry whenever Masons are convicted. Thirteen, you admit that no new lodge should be formed without permission of the Grand Lodge and that no countenance should be given to any irregular lodge or to any person clandestinely initiated therein, acting in contrary to the ancient charges of the order. Fourteen, you admit that no person can be regularly made a mason in or, make or admitted a member of any regular lodge without previous notice and due inquiry Fifteen and last. You agree that no visitors shall be received into your lodge without due examination and producing proper vouchers of their having been initiated in a regular lodge. These are among the regulations of free and accepted masons, and to these your assent must be freely given. Do you submit to these charges and promise to support these regulations? as masters have done in all ages before you. I do. Then, my brother, in consequence of your assurance, and with full confidence in your capacity and zeal, I will now install you as worshipful master of Arizona Lodge No. 2. And as worshipful brother installing Marshall, you will invest him with the jewel of his position. <coughs> That jewel, my brother, also repeated on your apron, is the square, an emblem of morality. 
And as it is the especial badge of the master's office, it should constantly remind you that not only by precept, but also by example, you should promote good morals among the brethren. And thus endeavor to avert the shadow of any scandal or reproach against the fraternity. Your former life has given evidence that this jewel will not be an unmeaning symbol in your hand. And I solemnly charge you to take good care that its luster be not dim with any act of yours. I now present you the book of holy writings. It is the great light in masonry and should ever be the great law of the brotherhood. It will guide you to all truth. It will direct you to eternal happiness. And an attentive regard to the divine precepts it contains will ensure your success in the fulfillment of the duties which you are now about to receive. <clears throat> the working tools of the craft will next be given you so that as the master worker, you may instruct the craftsmen in the various duties and virtues which they have been selected to illustrate. The square, which teaches us well to regulate our every action and to let our conduct be governed by the principles of morality and virtue. The compass. which teach us to limit our desires in every station, and never to suffer our passions or our prejudices to become the masters of our judgment. The rule, which directs the undeviating discharge of all our duties, that we should press forward in the straight path of right and truth without inclining to the one hand or to the other. In all our duties and in eternity of view. A plumb line, a symbol of moral rectitude. It teaches us to avoid all dissimulation and to pursue that honest and upright course in life which will tend to our elevation in the higher realms of immortality. There are still other important things which you will now receive in charge. The Book of Constitutions. Which you are expected diligently to search and from time to time to cause its contents to be read in your lodge, that none may remain ignorant of the precepts it enjoins or of the ordinances which it follows. And a book containing the bylaws of your lodge, which it will be your especial duty to see carefully and functionally executed. And a facsimile version of the larger document, the charter, under which, under the authority of which your lodge is held, and which you are carefully to preserve and duly transmit to your successor in the master's chair. You will now. <coughs> 